Hey, today's message is a little bit different. Uh, not not different. It's I think the delivery and everything, but but how it kind of get got pieced together for me was a little different because over the last um, several weeks, um, had a couple opportunities uh, just to share with some different groups of people, and I had a few opportunities where um, some folks were sharing with me, and we'll we'll get all that dialed in. Just um, just don't worry about that. I'll let Chris is good at this, um, and. Um, and in the midst of sharing with some different folks, one other thing that hit me was um, I was kind of spending some time with the Lord, and I felt like the Lord has kind of given me two little nuggets of things just to kind of think about, pray about. And I realized um, when I kind of went back to do some more study, I was like, oh, these two thoughts that popped in my head are both from the same chunk of Scripture, right? Just kind of giving me a little backstory. So I was like, all right, Lord, clearly maybe you're poking at me because all these thoughts keep coming from the same, like, Zone. So I just spent some time, was journaling, was praying, uh, and and then had time to share with a um, some volunteer leaders and some staff people in some different ministry capacities, and kind of put it all together when when we were you know we divvy up uh, our weeks for redeem of who's sharing and and uh, we pray through some series ideas and this go around we said hey we're just gonna have a couple weeks and uh, where we're gonna have some uh, uh, free range sermons I don't know what you wanna call them. Um, and in that whole process, it's really kept coming back to this. So this is, um, not a lot of, a lot of messages, right? There's a couple of jokes. Hey, there's some this, there's some that. There's not a lot of fluff. This is really just kind of like, we're just going to read some scripture and we're going to, I'm going to pull out a couple of thoughts that I've just been chewing on. And, um, the first part is going to be pretty, going to make sense. And the last part might feel like it's a little bit of left field but I think it'll all tie in at the end. Does that make sense? I'm kind of just kind of letting you into my soul a little bit, letting you know if you grab my journal, my last three or four journal entries probably were about this as I'm processing. So Father, as I get to share and I get the privilege, and, and I do consider it a privilege and an honor, Lord, I, man, you are the ultimate father. Fatherhood, family, motherhood, rearing children was not our idea, Lord. God, you are the ultimate father, the ultimate parent, the ultimate guide. You created this. You're the creator of heaven and earth. And you have handed over family and you have said, be fruitful and multiply. Make biological family members. Grow your family. But you've also said, make spiritual family members. Lord, you, your entire ethos is this idea that I am your God and that you will be my people. I will be the dad and you will be my kids. You don't have grandchildren. In other words, there's no separation between you and us. God, you're just as close to me as you are to everyone else in this room right now. You're just as present as to redeem church as you are to our friends that are struggling, who may be on the streets, who may be battling. Lord, you're just as part of redeem as you are the church down the street. Lord, you're doing something, and your heart is to make family members and sons and daughters. So, Father, we just make that our mission because that's your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, we're going to hang out on Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, mostly Luke chapter 10. And we're going to mainly hang out where Jesus sends out the 12 disciples, and then he goes out and sends the 72, and we'll wrap it all up. So let me just go ahead and read um, two chunks of Scripture, starting with Luke 9. Luke 9. Verse 1, ESV is the version, if you're into that, if you would like to know, that's what you got to know. And he called the 12 together and gave them the power and the authority over all demons and to cure, all disease, and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing on your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not take two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there depart, and whatever you and 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 wherever uh, and wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And as they departed, they went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. There's more that's attached to that if you keep reading that, but that just gives you a context of of the first part of Luke nine. We're going to come back to that in a second. What the, some of the things that happened after that. Flash forward to Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and said to them, 
and sent them on ahead of him. Man, I just love that idea. Jesus sent them on ahead of him. Jesus already had a plan and had a, a, a game plan and had a system and had a structure and had a word. And the men and women, the people, the, 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 the servants of God who are following him, who are his disciples, those who have been commissioned and sent out, he says, yo, go on ahead of me. I got something I want to do there, but I want you to be the I want you to be the foot in the door. I want you to be the first, I want you to be the tip of the spear. To think that the, the savior of humanity trusts us so much. He says, I want you to go first. Because I know when you go, you bring me. That's crazy. The savior of humanity trusts a bunch of knuckleheaded human beings at Redeemed Church. Man, I don't know what he's thinking, but he's obviously got the right idea. Two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his, into his harvest. We can stop there again. The harvest doesn't belong to us. CVS don't belong to me, don't belong to you, doesn't belong to Mr. CVS. Yesterday, I hung out at the, the celebration of cultures right here. Um, around the corner on uh, Motor Avenue, right in front of the Lakewood Theater. Hung out there, had some food trucks, listened to some music, saw some Bollywood dancing, saw some West African dancing. Um, I believe I saw some, I think it was Taiwanese dancers were out there, a few other things. And like I'm sitting here, like all these people that came to Lakewood, to the Celebration of Cultures Day in Lakewood. That's not my harvest. That's not Redeem's harvest. That's God's harvest. Those are his people. He's their father, Right? We are just supposed to be, and we're just making new friends. We're making new family. Go on your, go your way, or excuse me, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money, no knapsack, no sandal, and greet no one on the road. Wherever, you, uh, whatever house you enter, first say peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. But, uh, but if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. And do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go to the street and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, this, that the kingdom of God has come near, and I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than it is for that town. I was struck by reading uh, these verses because I just was so stirred. And and, and I'm going to give, I, I have, let me make sure, I think it's four. Yeah, one, two, three, four thoughts, and then one final thought that kind of summarizes everything. And here's my first thought after I read all this. My first thought is this. It works if you work it. Uh, some of us come from background at Life Center and Pastor Fulton Buntain. And if you remember, pa who remembers Pastor Fulton Buntain at Life Center? I know I got a few folks in here. And I, I used to call Pastor Buntain my spiritual grandfather. All right? He was because I met him when I was 15 years old just brand new to faith, brand new to Jesus. And he always treated me like I was one of his family members. And uh, I remember at his funeral, a uh, uh, couple of his, it, well, his daughter, Michelle, she came up to me and gave me a big hug. And his wife came up to me and gave me a big hug. And I remember Michelle said to me, my dad loved you. And she said, I want you to know how much he loved you. And I remember sitting and talking with Pastor Montana, and he would say this line, and I believe it comes from 12-step program, but I would talk to him, and he would say it from the stage, and I knew he said it in board meetings. I knew he said it in staff meetings. Mark Anderson, I know, is out here and can attest to this. How many times, Mark Anderson, have you heard Fulton Buntain say it works if you work it? So many times. And the idea here is that there is a system and a plan and a structure in place, and when you walk those steps out, you will get the results that were planned for the system and structure that's in place. Does that sound like God? Like I said earlier, the fatherhood uh, uh, is his idea. 
The harvest is his. The people are his. Lakewood, Stillicum, DuPont, Spanaway, University Place, Tacoma is his. We are, we are his ambassadors. We have been commissioned and sent out into his territory to say, what does the father want? And I'm going to do it. And when you work the plan, you get the father's results when you work his plan. It's fascinating because in, in, in Luke chapter 9, when he sends out the 12, he called the 12 together, the 12 apostles, and he sent them out. And they came back and they were like, Jesus, so much stuff happened. It was amazing. And in the meantime, and, and, and now, now hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a direct correlation from the 12 to the 72 because there's a larger contextual idea here that Jesus had three years of earthly ministry. Jesus had uh, literally thousands upon thousands of followers. And within that thousands, there were obviously the 12 that were the closest to him. It was at 12, there were three. But then there were other hundreds of people that were followers of Christ. Everyone different levels of commitment, kind of like the church today, right? But I think it's fascinating that after Jesus sends out the 12, and when you read through Luke chapter 9, after that, Jesus then feeds the 5,000. Then the, maybe the greatest question in human history gets asked after that, who do people say I am? And Peter makes his confession of the Christ. And then Jesus goes on to predict the plan that he has. I'm going to die, but don't worry. The temple's getting rebuilt in three days. I'm going to die. The Son of Man will lay down his life. But it's, there's a plan and there's a purpose and there's a reason for it. And then when everyone thought Jesus is like, oh, you're just another prophet, the transfiguration happens where he says, hey, here are all your prophets. Boom, they go bye-bye and I'm still standing. And then he goes out and he heals a boy who is possessed by a demon. And we see all these different markers. Every time there's a question, every time there's an, a, an idea, every time there's someone who wants to uh, ask about who Jesus is, Jesus is right there to present to them the simple fact that I am here of the Father. I have the, the Father's plan. I'm executing the Father's mission. I am doing what no one else can do because I'm the Savior, the Son of God. I am He. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the Vila, and N. And then, the next time the disciples and the, the greater picture of the, the disciples, the community of followers throw up on the scene, it's 72 more, six times more than the last time he sent people out. I just find that fascinating. That when you just walk faithfully with Jesus, I'm not saying redeemed church, we've walked faithfully with Jesus, six times more people are going to be in church next Sunday, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Don't take it so literal as one plus one equals two. But take it from a standpoint that says, man, when we're faithful to the Lord, when we're faithful to what he wants to do, when we lift him up and honor his purpose, honor his vision, honor his wisdom, say, Lord, here I am, send me. I'm stepping into Lakewood, I'm stepping into Silicon, I'm stepping into DuPont, and I'm just being who you've called me to be. The system works. So I think a lot of times we start to think, well, maybe I should do this. Maybe you should get some more lights. Uh, maybe I should, like look at this hashtag and tweet out this hashtag, or maybe I should do this, or maybe I should go to this church, or maybe I should hang out with these people, or maybe I should... No, you don't have to do a lot of extra stuff. You've just got to be. Be with him. Be who he's called you to be. Be in relationship with the people he's put around you. Faithfully be amongst the bodies of the believer. Don't uh, uh, forsake the assemblies of the believer. I think so many times we want to add all these different steps and ideas and things, but the Lord's just saying, I just want you to work it, because it works if you work it. Be with me. Follow me. Stand with me. Go when I tell you to go. Come back when I tell you to come back. Love those I tell you to love. Put your armor up. Go the extra mile. I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine this week because I introduced him. Um, uh, Kurt knows, uh, and Marty, uh, I believe, has also met. Uh, uh, a I have a friend named Lonnie who, who's a, a great pastor in this community, and he's become a mentor of mine. And I introduced a friend of mine to Lonnie, and my buddy calls me. He goes, dude, I just had lunch with Lonnie. It ended up being a three-hour lunch because it was so good. And it was like everything he said, everything he talked about is stuff the Lord's been convicting me of. And it just was another reminder in my mind. It's like what the Lord wants us to do is simple stuff. Every once in a while, man, there's some big Grand Slam home run experiences the Lord says to do and be a part of. But more often than not, it's are you being faithful in the right now in the moment? Are you working the system? Are you working the plan? Are you walking out in the fact that you've got authority and power in your everyday life and you're living in such a way? Are you walking out the fact that there are people around you who need an arm put around them and they need that love and that support and that, that hope and that strength and that grace that the Lord brings? 
Are you living out the fact that you're the one who the Lord has sent on ahead of him to be the tip of the spear? And you're just doing what he's told you to do. Are you doing that? Because if it works if you work it. It works if you work it. That, that's been hard for me at times this last year because I get so consumed. I get so consumed with making sure every box is checked, make sure every I is dotted. And you realize, oh, crud, I didn't do that. Oh, crud, I didn't do this. Oh, I got to do this, I got that. We get so consumed with the stuff. But then I just have to pause, Lord, and say, man, God, is this really what you want me to do? Yeah, I got to do some of the, 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 the extra busy stuff. But Lord, help me never to forget, Lord, there are things that you've asked me to do. And let me, no get so, let me never get so consumed with life and so consumed, uh, get so consumed, excuse me, if I'm, I can't think of my words out, so consumed with stuff that I'm not being faithful to the things you've called me to do because when I'm faithful to the things you've called me to do, where I go where you told me to go, where I'm in relationship with the people you told me to be in relationship with, it works. And it starts to make sense. I remember years ago when we were at Mount Tahoma, I was talking to someone after church and we were talking about some things that we were going through, some real real life hard stuff. I believe uh, I was talking to them for Kendra and I. This is when we were still battling infertility and they were sharing some stuff with, with me. And we both came to the conclusion, like the only part of our life that makes sense is Jesus, right? He's the anchor in the storm. So I got to make sure I hold on to that and I trust that. And the picture gets cleared up more and more every day. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's a magic wand, wave all your problems away, but something happens when you trust the Lord and you trust his plan and you live to what he's called you, you live the way he's called you to live, you serve where he's called you to serve, you go where he's told you to go, you, you do the things he's called you to do. And once again, when the disciples did that, went from 12 to 72. I don't think that's an accident that that's in scripture. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I don't. The second thing I noticed as I was wrestling with this, is it works if you work, it's number one. Number two, that the mission, the plan that the Lord has given us, it's supernatural by nature. The mission is supernatural. The mission is supernatural. It was, it was, it was fascinating. Kurt and I were having a chat this week with a local pastor, and we actually, this, this exact line was almost said verbatim, and I was like, ah, that's my message on Sunday. Stop talking, because people are think I got this from you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> But, but when we are going about our business in the world, we are not operating purely as natural individuals. It's supernatural. Luke 10, going back to verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed the 72 others, sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labor is few. Therefore, pray earnestly. He's like, you got to understand something like the, the exchange that's going to happen. It's going to happen on the, the, the natural playing field of life. It's real human beings. It's a real you. It's a real life and the real society. But what's really going on underneath the surface is there's a supernatural power and exchange that's happening. There's supernatural power and exchange that's flowing out of you. Well, maybe you're like, well, I didn't lay hands on anyone. And no one had blinded eyes received. No one, or no one spoke in new tongues. No one was healed. That doesn't, that's not all the supernatural is. That's part of it. And when that happens, man, let's get up. Let's get rowdy with it. Because that's amazing. The Bible says those are signs to point to what's really the truth, right? There are signs to make you wonder, where the heck did that come from? It came from God above. But the supernatural is stirring and it's happening every day. When we pray, we are developing a pipeline between us and the Lord. When we love others, we are, we are bringing it with us. Like I said here a few minutes ago, right? Jesus said, I'm sending you on ahead of me. I'm sending you to the places where I'm about to go. This is my harvest. I've got a plan. I'm going to do things through you. Uh, Gabe, I think I told you I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to go here right now. Verse 17 of chapter 10. We'll just read the first line here. We're not going to get too far into the 72 return to him. 
And they said this, Jesus, the demons were subject to us in your name. They were like, Jesus, I was out there and I saw a guy and he helped him and I prayed for him. Ah! It's my translation of the Bible. <laughs> like, it's in there. It's in the, the Greek Hebrew exchange of Septuagint. Big word, big word, big word. <laughs> I didn't think that's what happened because I know what's happened to me. Because I can take you back to being an 18, 19-year-old kid being in the streets of San Francisco and laying my hands on people who were drug addicted and, and, and strung out on drugs and alcohol and seeing God move and heal their life, right? That's supernatural. But I can also take you to being a senior in high school at Lakes High School sitting in the back uh, of the library because every Wednesday I fasted my lunch my senior of high school every Wednesday I fasted my lunch and sat in the back of the library at Lakes High School and I would pray and read my Bible I never made a show of it I never told anyone my friends would always say hey where are you we missed your lunch I'd look oh dude I have some never broadcast it but by the end of my senior year it was like the confessional at Lakes High School I would literally have friends lined up and be like will you pray for me Eddie I remember my buddy Corey Matney, I led to Christ back there. I remember Aaron Butler, who went on to play the, uh, a, a, a D1 scholarship at UW to play offensive line, would come back there and pray with me. I remember I had countless number of friends that I don't know how. I never broadcast. I never sent up a bat signal to say, if you need prayer, come find me. But I remember sitting back there just praying and reading my Bible and praying for my friends, and the Lord just brought the harvest. I can go through so many other times when I was working a job, stocking shelves at a grocery store, and a guy comes up to me and goes, one of my coworkers, and says, there's something different about you. Like, what is it? And I remember, like, he, like, kind of whispered to me. He's like, are you a Christian? <laughs> I remember another time when I moved back to Washington, I was looking for a job. I valeted park cars for a little while. And one of the security guards while I was valeting parking cars comes up to me and says, man, I just can't shake it, like, you're not like any of the other valets here. What is up with you? He goes, oh, you, you're a Christian? <gasps> I should have known. True story. His name was Troy. He was a security guard. We're Facebook friends. Go look him up. <laughs> <laughs> the mission is supernatural. And that's just part of who we are. Everywhere we go, we should be living in such a way where we go back to Jesus. I'm like, Jesus, you wouldn't believe it. I was at the grocery store pushing my cart and I saw someone and I just felt like I should pray for them and I stopped and prayed for them and ah, I was at the grocery store pushing my cart and someone ran into me because they recognized me and they said, have a bad day and I said, can I pray for you? I was at the gas station. Like the, the supernatural is all around us and, and it, it, it's it, a part of us and everything we're doing. Like I said, these are just thoughts I think. I think about Redeemed Church. I think when we said we're buying a building, I think we said we're going to get a church right in the heart of Lakewood. We're going to do this, and we're going to do the stuff the Lord's called us to do. It's been a supernatural effort from day one. Whether someone is strung out, sleeping behind the building, or someone wanders in here. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of people who just wander in this building, okay? Come, if you want just like, it doesn't happen every day, but man, when it happens, it's, it's, a, it's a fun experience, okay? I'll just say right that. And I don't know if fun's the right word, but we should call it fun, all right? But we're carriers of the gospel, we're carriers of the message of the Lord. And in every one of these situations, when things arise, we bring the power and the presence and the glory of God with us. The mission is supernatural. The next thing is, the next thing I noticed was, it works if you work it. The mission is supernatural. And the third thing I noticed is the burden is the Lord's. Like, check this out. It says this. Jesus, his words, not mine. Take nothing on your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, nor money. Don't bring two tunics. Oh, that's uh, chapter 9. I'm sorry. That's chapter 9. And then chapter 10, it says this. He says, go on your way. This is verse 3. Behold, I'm sending out as lambs. In the monks, in the midst of wolves, carry no bag, no knapsack, no sandal, greet no one on the road. I think a lot of times we, 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 we get this game plan in our mind that we think, okay, here's what I have to do. And, we, and the Bible says to count the cost, right? So we're not saying don't count the cost. You should count the cost. 
But I think a lot of times we get this idea in our mind that, that it's on us. And I think when the Lord, when Jesus here is talking to the disciples, and he's saying, don't bring these items, I think what he's doing is he's reminding them is that, or telling them, it's like, you're about to step into some stuff. And when you step into the stuff, I don't want you to have a crutch of any kind. Like, you know, when you do some studying, you know, I, was, I was digging up, I was like, okay, Lord, what, what's, what's going on here? What were you saying? What were some people smarter than me saying, right? Because it's obvious, okay, no money, okay, no resource. No knapsack, I don't have a duffel bag, a backpack to carry my stuff with. I don't have a, I don't have a staff for maybe for some protection. A lot of times the extra coat would be like a blanket when they're camping out at night. No blanket to bring comfort and warmth. The knapsack they had their stuff in would be like a pillow. So Jesus is like, no comfort. And then he says these words to the, to the 72, I'm sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. I'm like, Jesus, well, who are you doing to say what? <laughs> say what now, Jesus? Like metaphorically or actually? <laughs> like what exactly are you trying to say here? I just think it's fascinating that Jesus is like, I want you to get to such a place where every single, there, there's just no fear. And if there is fear, matter of fact, I think that's probably a better way to put it. Not that there is no fear, but when there is fear, like you're not looking for these crutches. You're not looking for these things to appease you or to comfort you, but you're leaning in more to me. And, and actually, that ties back into the, our very last point we're going to bring up here in a, in a minute or two. Like the, it's not on you to make this happen. It's not on you to seek comfort when things feel uncomfortable. It's purely for you just to trust me a little bit more. Because when you have no money in your pocket, man, whoever's been broke, <laughs> you know how to trust Jesus when you broke, man. You were like, oh, let me, oh, this, this water gonna last all week long, okay, when you broke. You're like, this, all of a sudden, when you're broke, you're like, Lord, oh, he filled up half a quarter of a centimeter of a thimble. <laughs> yup, I saw what you did. Praise God. You know, every drop. When you don't have anything, there's just this reliance on him. And the Lord, I think, I think he loves that. I think he loves when his kids are like, Dad, I need 20 bucks. I think he likes that. I think he wants that. So when we're out doing things, and, and believe you me, man, I'm going to tell you right now, I hope you're praying for Kurt. Kurt does a lot of work. Yeah. Kurt does so much. Dana does so much. Liz does so much. I hope you're praying for them. Because there have been some days where they're like, Lord, where the heck are we going to get this? <laughs> that, was, that wasn't tongues. That was... Like just real life. Everybody who ever been on the struggle, you're like, God, I've, I've been there a few times too, Eddie. I know that sound. You don't even have to describe that. I don't need interpretation for that one. <laughs> but there's so much going on, and it's so easy to think, I've got to make this happen myself. And Kurt, I don't want you to feel that way, brother. Dana, I don't want you to feel that way. Liz, don't ever feel that way. Chill it, kick it in the beach. Go have fun. Body, I don't ever feel that way. I don't want you to feel that way. Don't feel like you got to do this on your own. Don't feel like it's up to you. Like I said, this is just what I've been processing with the Lord. And can I be honest? And it probably comes across, but I'm still not like at the end. I haven't crossed the finish line for myself. I'm still processing some of this for me too. So when I say the burdens is the Lord, I'm learning on what that looks like for me. When my, my inbox was, I think I had 72 emails one day. I'm like, what the bleep? How do I? And I look at my phone, and I'm like, I just missed like six text messages and four phone calls. I'm like, Lord, ugh. And he's just like, Eddie, I got this. Like, I know you want to like take it all yourself and like, ah, make it all work and make it all fit. But I got this. Trust me. Mom and dad, I know you're trying to make it all work. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense. Inflation's going crazy. I know what I read the other day. It's going to take you four to $5,000 a year more to do what you did a year ago. Like, I know it's a struggle. I know it's hard. But I got this. I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm not saying you shouldn't be a good steward. I'm just saying I think sometimes the Lord just wants a reminder, like, like the world's going to be the world. Life is going to go crazy. But remember, when you're trusting me and when you're with me, like, 
There's no safety net. There's no parachute. Like, I'm the parachute. I'm the safety net. Trust me. Once again, we're not being, saying being responsible. We're just saying, I think sometimes the Lord just wants to remind us of his provision. Next observation is our message is peace. When he told them to go, in chapter 10, verse 5, he said, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. You know, the son of peace is there. Your peace will rest upon them. We serve the great prince of peace. We serve the God who in Matthew 9, or 5, 9 said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Isn't that fascinating? Like the, the, the thing that brings you into God's family, the highway, the roadway, the gravelly lake drive that brings you into the Lord's family is peace. Those people who make peace, those people when things are going crazy, who make peace, those are, those are my kids. Those are my sons and daughters. And I think it's fascinating that when you tie that back in here, it says, once again, I'm still unpacking this. It says, if a son of peace... If someone who's a part of our family, if someone who's like, yeah, man, I know what it's like to be living under troubled water, and I need that peace. Your peace will rest on them. The prince of peace, the, the bringer of shalom, the one shalom, as it should be, as God's orchestrated, as God's wanted it, as God's planned it. There's that idea again. It's his plan. It's his program. It's his agenda. It's his system. That's our message. I love what Philippians says. Gabe doesn't have us in slides, but it says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which literally means this. If everything I know is from here to the camera that's in front of me, God's peace says, I'm going to go beyond what you know and what you're able to do, what you're able to control. And I have got the entire road covered in front of you. So he says, the first word out of your mouth, when you're stepping into what I have for you, your first word out of your mouth when you're stepping into new relationship, new ministry, new people, is I want to bring peace to this situation. Because that's who the Son of God is. And that's who the children of God are. We are peace bringers and peacemakers. Last part, and, and, and that's it. And this is a, yeah, and I'll Jason come up and we'll wrap up here. Like I said, this is, it was funny as people were saying, talking to Kirk, and I shared with him a little bit, and talking to even my wife and a few others, saying, hey, what are you talking about? I was like, it's kind of hard to describe because it's just kind of what the Lord's been poking at me on. And the last part here, and I told you in the beginning, this all started when the Lord was kind of poking me at a few different things. And one of the things he was poking me on is I was, I was really struggling in my word a couple months ago, maybe about six, eight weeks ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I, and I had one day where I was like, yo, I've been doing this on my own, right? I've been answering those 72 emails. I've been uh, like fixing all these fires that were coming out. I got an email from someone who made me want to go, ah, and all these other things. And I was like, Lord, I need to spend some time with you because I haven't spent any time with you, but I've been doing stuff for you, but I'm not with you. And, and uh, I felt like this scripture came to my mind. And then this kind of blew up into a whole big thing. And the last point, let me tell you it. And then it'll make sense how we'll tie this all in together. Relationship, in relationship, and in revelation comes or will bring rest. In relationship or in revelation will bring rest. Okay, so here, let me, let me, give, let me break this down to you this way. Um, just read the verses and then we'll, we'll, we'll tie it all in. Luke 10, verse 17. The 72 returned to Jesus saying, Lord, we read this earlier, the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, Jesus did. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Do nothing, uh, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. First thing Jesus makes clear. We're doing all this amazing stuff for God and God's bringing all these amazing things together. He's given us this beautiful building. He's let us be a voice in Lakewood, Silicon, DuPont, Tacoma, and whatnot. And that's all great. But the greatest thing about Redeemed Church 
Eddie, you are the air director of Lakewood Silicon Young Life. You're planning all these camps. You got these leaders. You're 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 talking, the, sharing the gospel with people. You're you're trying to encourage people. You're telling about Jesus. You've been asked to speak at some really cool places. And yeah, it's fun and it's great. But that's not the best important thing. Believe a redeemed church. God's blessing. You're doing great things at your work. You're doing great things in your school. You're doing amazing things. Your family's doing good. Da, 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 da. You've been moving. You've been operating in all the stuff I've called you operating, which is good and which is awesome, right? Because it's, it's what the Lord told us to do. Disciples came back and said, hey, we did everything you told us to do. We worked it and it worked. We brought a message of peace. We brought a message of hope. We, 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 we cast out demons. We laid hands on the sick. We did all the things we, you told us to do. And when they come back to Jesus, they're like, yes, that's exactly what I told you to do. But there's one last thing. When you, that gets you excited, it should. But that's not even the best part. The best part is you have a relationship with me and my father. That's the best part is you are locked in. You're a part of the family. You're doing, praise God, don't stop doing. Hopefully you've been doing it the right way. Don't stop doing. But the most important part is that you're a part of the family. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, in the same hour, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. I, I like got stuck on that line, and I almost made a whole sermon about that, but I know how I would do it. But like, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. I don't know what that type of rejoicing is like, but that's got to be some next level praise, dancing, crazy, hallelujah, nutcase rejoicing, man. I could just like, I, as I read that, I remember reading that in my Bible and just, I could feel the spirit overwhelming me. Like Jesus, can you just imagine just being so excited and so happy? This is the son of God who's so excited about what's going on. He's like, ah, this is great. The Bible says he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And the other fascinating part about this, when you really like dig into it, the author Luke had talked to someone who Jesus must have told that to. So this was like Jesus leaning over to Kurt and be like, Kurt, man, when you came back and I saw you come back after working hard and being faithful and committing yourself to this church, I was so excited and so happy for you. And then Kurt went on to tell Luke, yo, this is what Jesus told me, bro. Like just even just that, like alone got me excited thinking about the exchange. Jesus was so full of the spirit. And then he's speaking that out. And the, the, the author writes it down and said, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. And Jesus said these words. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and you've revealed. There's the revelation. You've revealed these to little children. These weren't little kids that were doing this work. These were grown men and women. But right here, Jesus says they're little children. Why? Because there's something about relationship and revelation that's just so beautiful and childlike. It's this childlike wonder when you're with the Lord. Where he's like, you're peacemakers, you're bringers of peace. So you're my sons and daughter. You did what I asked you to do. And when you did what I asked you to do, you were just a faithful child. You weren't someone trying to achieve or trying to check a box. You were just being a faithful son or daughter with your dad, just doing what he told you to do being with him in relationship, being with your brothers and sisters. And I truly think that's what Jesus is saying. Dad, dad, they did what, I've, what we've always wanted them to do. They just were. Like you and I are, they are right now. And what does it say? Father, for such was your gracious will that in all things have been handed over to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son. And anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal. Jesus is so excited because he's like, man, dad, God, they get it. This is the type of relationship we have. And now they have seen you the way I see you. Now they know you the way I see you. And then turning to his disciples privately, he said, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many, many before you, many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Can I tell you something, church? And this is where the Lord crystallized all this for me, just for me personally, was simply this. When we see God the way Jesus sees God, when we have a relationship with God through Christ-like eyes, the way Jesus has set it up, that brings the ultimate rest or the ultimate peace. When you realize that, when you have that light bulb moment where you look and say, this is what it's supposed to be like, 
There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more peaceful. There's nothing more restful. There's nothing more refreshing. In the midst of all the busy, they were doing a lot of stuff, but their rest and their resource and everything they needed didn't come from just, oh, I'm just going to sleep in. Oh, I'm just going to go hang out. No, it came from actually in the midst of, of all the stuff going on, they plugged in and they held on to the Lord. And they were like, Lord, when we actually see the way you see, when we see what you see and we do what you do, man, there is this peace, this understanding, this joy, this rest that comes with it. I was, uh, the church I was a part of uh, many years ago, I was on staff at in Las Vegas, Nevada, did a lot of uh, conferences. And we always had a conference and uh, we were coming into one or coming out of one. I forget which one it was. But um, after the, con- I think it was before the conference, our church said, hey, we're going to start 5 a.m. prayer every day, 5 a.m. prayer. I was like, for, for staff, I was like, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> like, is the Holy Spirit awake at 5 a.m.? I don't know if he is. He's taking a nap. And structurally, I was pretty upset by it because uh, they said that, hey, you have to work your normal schedule and be uh, uh, every day for this segment of time being at 5 a.m. And I was hot. I'm not going to lie. I was heated. I might have shared the story before, I think, actually. But I remember one of the days I was heading in. I was running late. And a, a pastor friend of mine, our men's pastor at the church, he kind of pulled me aside and we had a good chat. And I just told him, I said, hey, man, I'm frustrated. I'm upset. He goes, I just feel like this is bad use of my time. I could be doing this. I need to be getting sleep because I got a youth thing. I got this. I got that. I had all these things in front of me. And we talked about it. And I remember this specific one day of prayer. I was praying. I was upset. I was grumbling. I was sitting in the back of our room we were praying in. And I kind of like, I kind of fell asleep a little bit. You know, it was five in the men, five in the morning. Come on now. Uh, but I had this moment where I stood up and I felt like in that moment where I stood up, I just had a vision in my mind. And I'll just say vision, but it really felt like the Lord was drawing me in, right? This is me and him. And the Lord gave me a picture of, I couldn't see God's face, but all I could see was like, it was a giant throne, probably the size of this building. And I could see God from about shin to lap. And if literally the throne is the size of this building, God was larger than this building, right? And I could see from shin to lap. And I was the size I am now, right? I'm just a regular sized guy. And in my vision, I curled up into the lap of the father and just laid down and went to sleep. And the Lord just spoke to me. And even though I still think some of the things they asked us to do was crazy, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'll be your rest. Like even when you feel like life is going haywire and, and, and sideways and all kinds of stuff, the Lord was like, I'm still here. I'm still your rest. Like, because when you understand you and me and our relationship, the way you view everything else out there is completely different. So the worship team is going to come up. We're going to close with another song. But church, can I tell you something? Number one, thank you for letting me just kind of give you a little bit of what I've been wrestling with on my own. Thank you for letting me kind of have a safe space. But number two, for all of us here, like, whatever the Lord is pointing for you, whatever the Lord is doing in you, whatever the Lord is directing you, my encouragement to you is to remember that it's not just about the doing. It's about the being. He wants you to be with him. And in being with him, he starts to pull everything together and make sense. It works if you work it. Our our message is peace. The burden is his. The plan is his. The harvest is ripe. We've just got to be faithful to what the Lord has. So, So, Father, thank you so much. We love you. We trust you. We give our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen.